so uh so chris who, what who's the person you want to invite yeah um so i i'd highly recommend uh Ky colleen kirtland uh so she she's very uh interested in biomimicry and agile teams and she'll she'd be a great addition hi today i'm talking with colleen kirtland as for colleen music is important We'll start and end with a song she performed herself. We talked about remote rehearsing songs during the pandemic with a group of people, about creating sustainable systems and creating space in our life. I'm Yves Hanul from Who's Agile. My pronouns are he and him. Welcome to my channel. You see a lot of Agilists around me on this screen. If you want to hear me interviewing, please click that subscribe button because these are the people that I've invited so far. If you think I'm missing people, let me know in the comments. And that like button, well, if you liked today's interview, don't forget to click it. Okay, all right. And, and um, so I like to uh, sing folk music because it, it's really simple. You don't need much, many instruments. Sorry, I'm going to try again. <laughs> By Paul McCartney. Mulligan time. Mist rolling in from the sea. My desire is always to be here. Oh, Mulligan time. Far have I traveled and much have I seen. Dark, distant mountains with valleys of green, past painted deserts. The sun sets on fire as he carries me home to the Mulligan Chime. Mulligan Chime, oh mist rolling in from the sea. My desire is always to be here, oh Mulligan Chime. Smiles in the sunshine and tears in the rain still take me back where my memories remain. Flickering embers grow higher and higher as they carry me home to the Moroccan time. Do -da -da -da. Hello and hello everyone. With me I have Colleen uh, and you probably heard already some uh, some nice introduction of her music. Um, so Colleen, um, one thing I want to to say is I'm I'm where the, the first thing that you asked when we joined here is where are you from? Well, let's show people a little bit uh, where I am. I am indeed from Belgium, and that is this little blue dot that you see. And now we're going to ask Google to move around, and then we're going. Uh, completely across the world, and if I'm not mistaken, then you're in uh, in Los Angeles, in uh, Greater Los Southern Angeles. Southern California, yes. yes. Indeed, indeed. And let's uh, bring us both back fully on screen. We don't need that anymore. Okay. Um, and for me, the time zone, my time, it's 19.52, so it's uh, a few minutes before 8 in the evening. What time is it on your side? It is 10.52 in the morning here, and it's a beautiful spring day in Southern California, which means it's going to probably hit 72 degrees with absolutely clear skies. Ah, well, in, in the, like, like I said, it's the end of the evening, but it was actually not a sunny day here in Belgium, so it was uh, mostly raining. Uh, so, so, yeah, another way to connect, another way to see that uh, although we're we're talking together this is a different in a different time zone and actually the weather is different as well so that's uh, yeah, that's that's how we roll that's how we do it these days but we jumped uh, i jumped right into a little bit but before we completely jump into the interview 
Tell us a little more, Colleen. Who who are you? What do you want people to know about you? Oh, goodness gracious. Um, well, my name is Colleen Kirtland, and I guess I could say that uh, one hat I wear is a proud member of the Agile community. Um, in terms of my day job, I, I guess I, I've been in technology for many years, uh, in technology leadership. And that's a very important component of how we practice agility um, at work. But I think um, even more so and more near and dear to my heart are the various charity organizations that I volunteer for, my husband and I volunteer for. And so um, in, in my other identity, uh, I am a board member as well as volunteer music director for a wonderful children's chorus for under-resourced kids in Orange County, mm -hmm. California. And uh, yes, we are a choir, the Kid Singers. Um, that's all one word, kidsingers.org. And it's just a beautiful organization. We are celebrating our 26th year. And I'm very honored to be a part of the team. Um, I, I've been supporting them for about 15 years, but uh, we joined the board about uh, during the pandemic sometime. And then I got the lucky privilege um, during that time when we had to pivot with all these kids, we went on Zoom rehearsals because uh, we couldn't be singing in person and they needed somebody to help with Zoom. And then I just fell in love with the kids and then I stayed and we have since gone back um, in person where choral uh, music instruction really should be taught and it's so much better. But it was wonderful to be able to pivot. Um, such a nimble organization. We actually did this thing where uh, 50 kids remained with us through the pandemic, about 50 kids. And we did this production where we had kids with their own individual headsets with a soundtrack and they each sang individually. And then we merged it electronically uh, into choral productions for two years. So yeah, it was really wow. <laughs> That's 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 wonderful. I've seen a few videos uh, on the internet. I have no idea if it's from 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 your organization, but I've seen some 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 videos indeed during the pandemic. How many people tried in many ways to to make music? I have quite some some. Well, I have some prof uh, friends who are professional music and who told me how hard it was to do this thing. So I can imagine if you do this with uh, 50 children, it's uh, it's even harder because of course they they might have all the energy and they might have really the, the thing to say, okay, I want to make it work. But at the same time, they might not have all the, the well, first of all, the equipment and they, they have not might not have all the knowledge. So, so it's in, really interesting if you try to do these kind of things. So yeah, thanks I for doing that. I commend the musicians and artists, the professionals, which I am not, but I commend the professionals for um, staying with it. It must have been such a hard time to not be able to reach live audiences. And it taught me about digitization, Eves, in a way that was very profound to me. I know many companies are seeking digital transformation, this, that, and the other, but it made me profoundly aware that um, the human element of digital still needs to be considered. And some things like the arts are very hard to translate. There's something about the life, the liveness and the togetherness and maybe the way in which we sense in groups as humans that makes it very hard to translate the artistic experience um, into virtual. We did it as much as we could during the pandemic and tried to instruct the kids and be very one-on-one -on -one with them. But when you're in the room, you can sing close to them. You can you can feel them. You understand what kind of challenges they're going through that day. You can you can just get a, a reading much better. So that part about reading the room and being presence present, there's a certain dimension that's lost in any any digital engagement. I think. Yeah, I, I agree. It makes it harder, but at the same time, I was really happy that many artists try to do it during the pandemic because singing and, and music is one of the things that that unites people so i agree that it definitely was not uh, yeah i like to listen to to live concerts on youtube but i definitely prefer to go to live music much more than i like to listen to to to, to yeah to anything on, on youtube but it, it's nice that we can even in the pandemic that we had this technology to stay connected and to try some of these things yes, and in that yes. way I, I really like that that and what i've seen is actually for me 
again, and I'm not surprised that artists are actually some of the most people, the most creative thing on, on looking for solutions for doing that. I've seen really a lot of yeah artists trying to make music, trying to connect in a digital way, even if it was not really working. And like you say, listening in your earphones about real music and then singing, because you can't sing each other uh, uh, together because there's too much lag in, in between and everything is too slow. Um, but but still, it, it's good that we try to look for, for these kind of solutions to, to have children feel a connection. So thanks for sharing this already. We jumped right into a nice story already. I like it, I like it. <laughs> I'm full of stories. <laughs> well, well, that, that's why you were invited, I think. But the first one that really is, the, the first question is really, what is something that, uh, that people usually don't know about you but, that has influenced you and in, in who you are? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, I think it would have to be my past familial history. So my parents, they... Um, they grew up in uh, World War II China with the whole communist and Kuomintang separation. And wow. they had to leave China as refugees to Taiwan back in the 40s <laughs> when, and when this final separation came. And, you know, it was very funny listening to how polarized um, the communists and the Kuomintang were. Unfortunately, I, I feel my dad and I talk often about similar, a similar feeling of polarization in the United States. And we hope that politics doesn't end up dividing people to the point where we have a civil war. I think there's a lot of lessons we learn in the past about um, kind of these artificial divisions that are actually fed to us by different bodies of government or whomever, you know, is trying to, to feed these messages to us. And it, I think it's so important to stay um, very closely connected to what we actually think and to maintain our sovereignty and autonomy in, in, in thinking mm -hmm. about these kinds of things. I mean, it was really interesting, um, you know, and I mean to say all of this respectfully, but um, when we had that uh, insurrection on January 6th in the United States, um, unfortunately, my, my dad felt very heartbroken because he said, I, I came to this country because I thought it was a place where we could, you know, continue to have real dialogue about things. And he said, remarkably, um, whether you're a dictator on the extreme right or the extreme left, you look completely identical. And he remembers uh, very directly the cultural revolution in China and, and, you know, our family was a part of it. My dad was the only one who actually could escape China at that time. And um, all of his siblings were left behind. And they had to endure the cultural revolution where every school teacher and person of knowledge was sent to the countryside to work in a labor camp because there was a threat, um, from kind of an intelligentsia threat, right? And, and, and so it's, it's just interesting that whether you're looking, what, no matter how the label is, um, whether we say dictatorship from, that comes from the right or the left in politics, the actual underlying soul is sort of the same in that it seeks to oppress different voices and voices that want to say something maybe opposing the regime. And so I think that those, those things remind me that um, many of us uh, in the global north, <laughs> including Europe and the U.S., are very lucky people and that um, all the problems that we have are, you know, in, in the grand scale of things, solvable if we only, you know, have the willpower to do it. Yeah, and I, I agree that, well, if, if I see what's happening a lot in the, in the States these days with banishing books and other th kind of things that, that it's really, it, it, it feels very similar to, to what you were describing indeed about, okay, people being, people at the top being afraid of, of yeah, having their, the citizens of their country knowing about certain things, uh, and and it's for me it's not the the um, there's nothing wrong in these books. It's more like okay, they will know about other ways of thinking, and they might realize oh, there is actually uh, the the world is not so 
black and white and there is other things yes. um, and for me that that actually is what what is much more needed I, I have family members who felt when they grew up that they didn't have the role models that they needed and and they, yeah for me there is a world that we see a lot more role models but at the same time people in power are really afraid of, of people who are yes. different one way or another yeah yeah and and I think that uh this is one of those times to really lean into the gray space. You know, you said it's not black and white and it's so important um, to stay engaged and curious in the gray space and not come too quickly to judgment and try and understand and not label too quickly. It's, it's one of those times. And I actually think um, since this is a podcast for Agilists, that we have a very important role here to keep people in the gray space, curious, engaged, mm -hmm. and, um, kindly and firmly interested in, in, in seeking truths together. And I say truths and together is, is kind of two key elements of it is that we're not islands of truth ourselves, but collectively maybe we can come up and better understand, you know, collective truths that belong to us all. Yeah. And I, yeah. And, and there is, well, I think Agile is no no different than, than any other part of the world in the sense that we also have our religious wars and our things where we, we fight and we have the idea that uh, one person has a better idea than the other, where it's actually much more like, okay, how can we coexist? And okay, the, there are things that, that might be considered completely evil in, 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 in all kinds of things, uh, but still there, it doesn't mean that uh, for me, when, when somebody makes a mistake uh, or even does something bad, that doesn't make that person bad uh, entirely. There, there still is other parts of it. And I think it stays important in, indeed to stay at the human side and, and to see people as humans. Um, at the same time, for me, there is a lot there also in the feedback. When people receive feedback, sometimes feel, people feel like, okay, you're, you're attacking me as a person. And no, uh, I think it's, it's, it is important, first of all, to, to give feedback on the actions much more than on the people. Uh, but also then when people receive feedback that they see it about the action and it's not about the person. So, uh, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. And, not, and stay in that gray zone, like you say. I, I really like that. Uh, probably a sentence I'm going to to reuse later on because it's indeed. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think it's it's for me. Agile is indeed about figuring out that gray zone. Uh, there's nothing, no only one true way. I, I don't like the word best practice. There are some good things that we can do and things that can improve. And then it goes to another color, and if it's gray or if it's another color, but, but not always that black and white. Wow, immediately really deep. That's uh, thank you for sharing that. And it, I can imagine that, yeah. But if it, the story that you shared, I can imagine that you heard many war stories, and in, in this case, war stories are really uh, accurate from your family leading back to to to, to this day. Um, so that's, uh, and I think it's really nice that you can still talk with your father around these things because it's important that, uh, that we keep learning these kind of things. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. I want to move to that, uh, second question. If you, if you had not been doing what you've been doing now, do you have any idea? Is there something that you were destined to become or, or oh, you, you know, this is, this is a beautiful question. I actually think that I am becoming what I need to become. Um, mm. I, I think, you know, maybe in our adolescence, we had these dreams of being like, you know, a rock star or whatever. But over time, it's not that these dreams get crushed. It's that we tune and become attuned to our actual selves. And we learn to appreciate our own superpowers and our own special gifts. Mm. And so I think that this space that I'm in now um, I don't even know what you call it. I mean, Agile definitely opened up a lot of doors for me years ago, but I think there are these adjacencies to Agile that um, I'm kind of becoming now. Um, I'm actually going to be speaking at a conference in a few weeks called um, Agilists for the Planet. And I will be talking specifically a little more about these adjacencies, but uh, some of the things that Agile led me to um, study more deeply and understand 
were the areas of complexity science, uh, regenerative economics, um, organic farming, and Zen Buddhism. And wow, that's that's really in all kinds of directions. Yes, I'm in all kinds of directions kind of person, but there's a there are key underlying themes of respecting systems that are greater than the sum of their parts and systems that are so complex that actually measuring them would become sort of this tiring exercise that would suck up all our time. And so the question is, how do you get into that space where you, you're still appreciating it and learning it, but you're not always seeking to observe it from the outside. And so I've, on a phil philosophical level, I've kind of been exploring through some of the Zen practices is, is there an outside view, right? I mean, some of our Western enlightenment thinkers uh, during the era of uh, scientific revolution believed that we can have this observation notion from the outside. And the question is now, I think, can we? And um, that I, I'm not smart enough to answer that question, but there are a lot of people that are a lot smarter than I am that are really looking into that. And some of the complexity scientists, I think, are just nudging us away from, or not away, sorry, everything's a part of our history, but some of the complexity science people are nudging us into this direction where I think they're really challenging like Newton's view of the world for everything, right? And, 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 and I think that is really profound. And I'm seeing that as a theme of many, many very smart people who actually did start with a physics you know, background, whether it's Stephen Strogads or, um, oh, I can't think of his name right now, um, Stuart Kaufman. Uh, and, and, and these are people that are really looking and saying, wow, there are definite things in this world that behave in a mechanical way, oscillators. We need great civil engineers to look at forces and, and more rigid structures. Uh, so, so all that math and everything about that is still very true, but it's just that when it comes to the forward creation of things in this universe, whether it be actually our economy or whether it be evolution of living systems, that's where it starts to break down, right? And, and I think that, you know, um, many of these really bright folks have been studying this like since the late 60s and it kind of went into chaos theory in the 70s and then it went on and on into complexity science. So I guess in the, the grand scheme of our billions of years of evolution on the planet, it's very new. But when it comes to like being new within our lifetime, it's really not that new. I mean, it's been around, but it's, it's something that's so, I'm so excited to bring to the Agile community because a lot of things and I will say phenomena in Agile, I think rests more with the complexity than it does with sort of, you know, the, the mechanical systems. And we've been talking about that a long time, but I think there's really rich material to look at. <laughs> I really, I really like that. The, 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 yeah, because and and you're not the first uh, I talked earlier about uh, Jutta Eckstein, who's uh, probably also I know that she's interested in a lot of other things uh, as well. And indeed, yeah, the, the it, it, it's similar to when we talked about music earlier on. But music is not there is no magical formula for music and and of course there's people trying with computers predicting what music will do and whatever but still yeah it, that's not the only way or not the i would even say the best way to create music um so there is there is complexity and i think it's the same thing for software uh software is really in that uh in that uh, complex sphere and, and yeah, all living systems one way or another. Uh, so that's, uh, that is indeed, yeah, there is, there is still a lot to explore. Um, there is, the, yeah, I've just been had, uh, yeah, thinking and discussing with a friend about uh, the, all the, the things that, yeah, can, can programming be fully automated with, with one, with some of these AI tools and it's like, yeah, we're getting closer. But still, no, we're, I don't think we're there, uh, even if it's just because customers don't know what they want and can't tell what they want. So, yeah, that's the minimum that you need to have if you want to have an AI system doing. And that's it's just all too complex. Um, yeah, so so there is still a lot there that uh, 
will change or that need to to will will happen in, in yeah. all of these years. I, I think. So that, oh, ahead. no! I was going to say, um, there's a couple people that I think are starting to tie in um, software complexity with complexity theory. Um, one of them is Melanie Mitchell from the Santa Fe Institute, and another one um, is Stephen Wolfram. He wrote a book called A New Kind of Science in 2008, where he was exploring um, different code bases to generate these patterns for cellular automata. And what he noticed that certain types of um, lines of code actually generate visual patterns that are unexpected after they iterate for X number of times, you know? And so it's, it's really interesting. There's some good pictographs of it, but it, but it it lends itself to complexity science in the sense that, right, I mean, basic computation requires input, rule making and output, right? And if you, if you feed in in iterations different input, sometimes there is chaotic unexpected behavior. And that's exactly the kind of sort of natural science that, um, you know, is in complexity science. Of course, it, the applications of it go far beyond computers but it is a very interesting thing in that, you know, we're trying to model basically like carrying our past with us. So if you think of an agile team, carrying our past with us and then taking our feedback and learnings into the next iteration. Wow. Sometimes the slightest difference in a condition or an environmental situation might yield to something that we didn't expect. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've, I've said before that, um, yeah, if, if a software team runs out of coffee, you get all kinds of strange actions. And that's <laughs> something that we can't always predict. Of course, we, we want to avoid that situation, but yeah, it, it happens even if it's just the coffee machine breaking down or the water breaking down or whatever. Yeah, there's, and, and there's so many uh, unpredictable stuff that will happen because it's a, a bunch of people that you put together. And uh, anyone can have a bad day and then can, can influence uh, these others in multiple ways. I love it. It's the coffee coefficient. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Let's move to that next question. If What do you consider your biggest challenge, at least the biggest challenge that you want to, to share on the internet? Um, and why is it good for me? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to add that second part later to, to oh, it. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I wasn't sure if the video froze or if um, actually, you know, you were asking part of the question. Uh, well, I think the biggest challenge right now that I'm directly involved with is how we create sustainable, healthy practices everywhere. <laughs> whether it's from economics to how we treat our teams, you know, and how we, how we don't sort of continually extract from, exploit and take from too much from one part of the system, right? So many kinds of um, systems, I mean, team burnout is because we take too much from the team, right? And we don't look at other ways. And so I think that biggest challenge is sort of something that many people are thinking about is, We've, we've been pegged for so long now on this notion that ec the economy should be optimized on say GDP or something that kind of just looks at continuously increasing output. And then when you, when you look at this you know, situation of a growth optimized economy that's not at pace with the way the planet can renew itself, we got trouble, right? And so, so that's kind of the biggest challenge I'm working on is to be a part of this. I mean, I'm, I'm one person in this giant universe, but that is what is in my DNA at the moment that is really just keeping me going is how do I become a part of this change slowly but surely in every place and every way every day. You know, so that's, that's kind of it is sustainability and the environment, you could say. <laughs> Talking about putting the bar really high for yourself because it's it's already something really hard to solve as a society. Uh, but when I ask about your biggest challenge, you immediately see that also for yourself, which at the same time I understand and it, it also worries me like, whoa, okay, that, that 
it's not yeah it's, it's a lot for, for one person to carry i would say um and of course you're not doing it alone uh but i do understand the worry because yeah there's so many things that we see in our society where where yeah you see people optimizing for one thing and when they talk about optimizing for the whole system they're still thinking a part of that system and not thinking about the whole planet and and yeah everything mm -hmm. that uh, goes there I I think some of the, the beauty of that journey that I was telling you about actually has helped me answer how to show up every day. I actually don't have grand designs for this because clearly I'm not gonna be able to solve it, but I can solve one key part of the equation, which is myself and how I behave and how I act within the system. That is fully under my control at this very moment and going forward into every moment, you know, and so, um, I think I learned the most in this past two years from two groups of people that I really got to know well, organic farmers and uh, Zen Buddhists. And I'll start with the organic farmers. Uh, I have a friend who runs, uh, is a um, co-director of this wonderful nonprofit here in the US called The Real Organic Project. And she and that whole group is really looking at re-educating not only our government, but the public in the ways of what is organic farming, right? We have all this greenwashing with our food labels and everything. And when it really comes down to it, organic farming is about caring for the soil and building a self-sustaining system where the soil can take care of itself. And so when you look at it that way, you know, uh, I think what's interesting is, is we don't meddle with things, right? And so it just, it, it really sank into me as an agilist about creating space and creating environments for people to thrive is that you don't apply a bunch of petrochemicals on them and force them into like hyper growth. You have to step back and create an environment where the organisms within the environment can breathe and live. And every place and location is different, right? I mean, the kind of soil health in the Northeast versus where I live here in Southern California is entirely different. It would support a different ecosystem and all these things. And so one of the interesting things that I think um, that, that I've reflected on with the Real Organic Project is, you know, all this like scientific kind of innovation around trying to get carbon back into the ground is kind of bizarre to me. And it's bizarre to me because, you know, it, it's not about those systems, according to soil scientists are so complex that we can't, we don't understand them enough right now. And every time we actually take away biomass, which is like trees and plants, we're actually making it more and more difficult to get carbon back into the ground at a healthy pace and in the way the ecosystem needs it to be, right? And so I think that part of kind of non-meddling observation and humility to the environment that we live in gives me a lot of peace because it, it means I don't have to be like out there pounding the pavement and, and going for all these methodologies and trying to sell things. I gotta step back, step back and look and observe and, and be part of something. And, and, and I think some of the, the Zen Buddhists too that have just sort of talked about, you know, stepping back enough to observe ourselves in the system and what we're doing is so important. And that when we meditate, we're actually just reflecting on what we can know intuitively and not trying to calculate it too much, right? And so I think, I think in, in that sense, yeah, I, I, it, it can be so overwhelming for all of us um, at this time to say, oh my God, we have to save the planet. But in a very simple way, if we just step back and breathe, we are saving the planet. We're slowing down and our breath is a part of the environment and we don't have to be rushing to get somewhere. You know, I think that those are things that I, I, I'm trying to work on now and the, the practices seem to be helping me. So I, I'd invite anybody to explore more because, you know, we're all under all this pressure to try and change the system and yet the part that we really can change is us. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and I can reflect it immediately to, to the Agile teams is that sometimes the best thing to do is just go in, observe, talk with people, understand how they work and, and ask a few questions, but not 
push some kind of methodology onto them. It's like, you know, okay, let's, let's see. Okay, we can give some examples and let them figure out gradually what works for them, what doesn't work. Okay, sometimes challenge a little bit, but 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 not trying to push. And like you say, a little bit, when you talked about pushing chemicals on, onto plants, it, it, I also think about some of the methodologies that we push sometimes on people and say, this will make your life better. Well, it depends a little bit, like you say, the soil in, in California is not the same thing as in Belgium. So whatever works in Belgium won't work in, in, in LA or might work, but we don't know. There's no guarantee. Um, yeah. And we can talk to each other. We can learn from each other. But it's um, it, it's not like 100% applicable. And, and yeah, Un unless if we understand why it's working. And again, then, then you come back to... To, to what you said earlier, that you said we don't understand enough about these systems to, okay, we need to learn a lot more about nature and all these kind of influences, I think. And and that's that's already, a, I think, a part of why it's good for you, but is, is, is there more? Is there, when you say, okay, this is a challenge for me, what, what's really good for you about this thing? That part? Um, come again, like, if, if there's a well, the, uh, we, we talked about the challenges and, and that second part of the question is why is that challenge a good thing for you? And I think you kind of answered it already a little bit like, okay, it makes me slow down and, and things like that. Is there anything more? Is there something more? I think, I think that it's reaffirming that human work is a skill. <laughs> mm. It is a skill to be developed and cultivated and I think I, I've learned this the most in my uh, volunteer choral directing with the kids singers is that, you know, the way to engage people and get them out of their shells is not to force them, but to find situations to have them connect with themselves. And I've seen the transformation on the ground with kids who come at the beginning of the year who are so shy, they sit there really stiff and, you know, they, they don't even want to sing. And, you know, we don't, force them to sing, we, we, we work with them and we, we help them find their own voice. And I think that that part of the human side is, it's not about my ego, it's not about how great the choir is, it's about can we help somebody find their own voice? And I think that reverberates as well in our agile practice, right? Is, is helping every one of us find our own voice. I, I really like that. And I really like, yeah, the, the, the thing that you, you stressed out, okay, the, the kids come there in the beginning, they then some of them don't even want to sing. Uh, I've seen that in many different kind of things. I help people uh, learning to code, so children in, in a code of dojo. And there we have something similar is that they, they are afraid to talk. They're afraid to, to tell their name and, and things like that. And just giving them space and asking them, okay, and sometimes making a little bit joke, okay, I, you have to speak louder because I'm getting, I'm getting deaf or something like that. It makes them smile a little bit and gradually they, they talk some more. And some of them will do a demo at the end of the day and others won't and, and that's fine. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's, it's giving them space in, in, in ways. And I hear a lot in, in your story for the, the, the children that sing, okay, they come, officially to sing because that's a choir but giving them space to discover what is my voice where do i stand is probably a bigger message than than the learning what learning to sing actually it's yeah uh, and, and i think the safety to make all kinds of mistakes i mean all of the choral directors we make mistakes all the time and we deliberately laugh at ourselves in front of the kids and say oh I should have done that much better. Let me try it again. It's okay. You know, this is, and we, we tell people that we tell the kids, you know, this is a safe place to make mistakes. In fact, we want to make as many mistakes as possible during rehearsal. Cause then we kind of know what our range is. We know, you know, how we're going to perform when we're in front of an audience. And, and I think there's so much about that, that practice and that, you know, we make mistakes all the time and, you know, um, I think music is one of the great teachers of mistake making. <laughs> yeah, I, I I really like that because indeed in music it's it's so in the moment and it's very it's only one half a second or a tenth of a second not paying attention and we make something we we make a mistake and if you have a choir with fifty or more people 
it, it's very easy that something will go wrong with, with one of these things. Uh, and if you're in front of them and you didn't pay attention, yeah, you or, or you might have said some or did a wrong sign to make people think in the wrong direction or whatever. Yeah, I, I can imagine that a lot of that happened. Um, and I really like that you, you stress it, that you want them to make the mistakes or, well, you don't force them, but you want to make as much mistakes during rehearsals because indeed, in reality, it will also happen during a concert. There is a lot more stress, so the chances that there will be mistakes is, is even higher. And, and you want to be prepared and you want to be ready how to deal with that and, and think, okay. And not, yeah, I don't know, if, if something goes wrong, not freeze and then, yeah, then it's even worse if, if a mistake happens. Uh, thanks for sharing that. And thanks for also, indeed, like you say, as, as if you're there in front of the children to actually say, okay, yeah, shoot, I made a mistake, things like that. I think it, it, it shows the children that mistakes are, are possible and, and okay. I think and also, oh, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I was no, going to say, um, as agile leaders, you know, let's not forget we're all still growing even as adults. And so there are, I think, few safe spaces where people really feel like I can go for this and keep trying, right? That That's very important for us to cultivate in our workplaces is you know, this place for practice all the time. And I think uh, our community certainly understands that, but there's a lot of places in our workplaces that still kind of push for just the output. Let's hurry up and get in line and do this. And we're kind of not being very thoughtful about developing the different craft and um, mastery <laughs> for people to get better at whatever it is they're doing, you know? And, and I think I, I've seen so many transformation stories year after year with the kids in choir where, you know, we have had some cases where a complete shy wallflower becomes one of the choir soloists. And that just like, that gives me so much hope um, that it's possible when somebody has the will and wants to practice and then they have the space to do it, that somebody who maybe was shy and bullied becomes a soloist. And I, I, it's happened this season. I, I'm, I'm expecting it's going to happen again and again. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, yeah, I've, I've heard many, many stories about that, and it's it, it it also helps. I think I've seen a few introverts that found a certain space where they can be, and, and it, introvert doesn't mean I don't want to shine, I don't want to be in front of people. No, it it's certain things take energy, and 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 connecting with people, going outside takes energy, and if you're then a soloist or somebody else who's front and center people automatically come to you. So it makes it easier to connect to other people. And so once they've discovered that, they now discovered this now as a child, but they will probably discover later on other places where they can um, can can be and, and, and learn about uh, making connection in their way. Um, and, and somehow we live in a world where um, extroverts are seen as the better communicators. And I'm not sure that's uh, that's always the case. Um, there's there's just multiple ways, and the problem is that the extroverts we see the fastest, and we think that uh, yes. yeah we see that as uh, as the best, but uh, not not always. And like you say, giving space to other people, if it's shy, it could be other other kind of ways. Will will give them ways to flourish and to find themselves. So I, I think there's another message in this for adult teams. It's come as you are and feel safe to be who you truly are because uh, especially with the teen group, you know, I find these days that social media has taken a, a very negative hold on people's images of their own body and what they should be. And uh, particularly with young girls that we've coached uh, who are entering sort of puberty and, you know, it's, it's just devastating to see that they have these pictorial images on Instagram of what they think they should be. And, we are really cultivating, you know, we, we love you as you truly are. And, and, and if you find yourself as you truly are, you'll feel a lot better. And, and it just this constant thing where we, we have these discussions with the younger women in particular, but I, I know that, that boys go through that as well. It's the same thing. So I think 
if we carry that again into the workplace, you know, a lot of these th things haunt adults. <laughs> and so we have to be aware of all of these things that may be haunting somebody and preventing them from truly coming to admire and appreciate how they were born and what skill they actually have. I really like that you bring that part in because indeed, and I think it's, it, it, it's kind of strange. I see two movements almost at the same time. We have the movement indeed that on Instagram, everything looks very shiny on all these perfect pictures. And at the same time, there's no almost no real bodies anymore. And, and we live in a much more system that it's it's almost yeah illegal to to show kind of kind of nudity in whatever way uh, and 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 that people don't see it around it and i, I heard discussions some some weeks ago uh with colleagues say okay but you can't have your children see yourself naked i'm like yeah but then then the only thing they will see is even worse because then it's only about perfect pictures whatever and and then then it's yeah and and like you say, in, in adulthood, I, I know a few people that even it took them until they were 30s or 40s before they could accept their own body with whatever, because they had some feeling yes. that then came not even from social media, because the, this, these are people who grew up without social media. So I'm indeed really worried what will happen with that generation that grew up completely with, with social media and, and seeing only more or less pic perfect pictures and, and yeah, comparing themselves constantly. That's um, that's definitely something. And I think it's it's just, like you say, it's it's not just about pictures. It's about almost everything. Yeah? Um, that's uh, yeah, the the thing about failing and the thing about yeah, because social media shows most of the time the the better things. It's for me one of the reasons why I don't want to do too much editing on this. Of course, there is a part I don't have the time to do too much editing. But for the other part, is it should really feel like a normal conversation without too much editing. And if there is a little bit of glitch, that's okay because this feel in a normal conversation. The, if something drops, whatever the, in, in a normal if we're sitting in a cafe, there might also be something dropping. We also keep talking, and uh, I don't want to to be a perfect movie or a perfect interview. It's um, it's a little bit in that idea, or uh, yeah, that that I wanted to to do that. It's it's really wonderful that you you link indeed, like like you said earlier on, you link a lot of these things together. Um, and at, at the same time, for me, it feels like we shouldn't see Agile as always the, the best thing and Agile as the name for everything that is good, universal. But at the same time, Agile is very value driven. So it, it feels kind of logical that when we talk about Agile, we talk about values and we talk about well, maybe saving the world, but, but at least making the world better uh, for, for the people we're working with. It seems you do a lot of the, these nice things. And I already feel um, a lot of passion there. And so that next question goes right into that. Is Do you know where that drive, where that passion is coming from? Mm. That's a great question because I think the best way to draw that parallel is uh, we've all recently seen those beautiful pictures from the James Webb Telescope that shows us different universes at different ages. And there's the young ones that emerge from the void. We don't know, I mean, it's from nothing, it turns into something, right? And so I can't say I really know what drives me, but I know that whatever it is, I have to be still and silent enough to listen and be a part of the void. Cause that's the place where really emergent ideas come from. They're not forced. And I think that's kind of, I'm not an expert or a psychologist or a neuroscientist, but I'm guessing that creativity stems from the void as well. And so mm -hmm. ironically, you know, the practices that we have been used to and accustomed to in the industrial world, which is go, 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 get it, get it, get it, use book knowledge, you know, put together all this left brain knowledge, synthesize it and churn it out into something else. That's not bad, that's still good, it can expand our view. But there are different ways of knowing. And so this 
contemplative way of stopping all the noise and all the cerebral thinking and all the language is indeed what drives me. I do practice meditation four times a week very regularly and observe the chatter in my head. And I try to, over time, still it. And some of my best ideas have come out of that void. And so I think what drives me is emptiness, believe it or not. <laughs> mm. but, yeah, I, it, it reminds me a little bit about, yeah, when, when you have children, that there, there's always a moment when, when they're young that they, they get annoyed and they, they get bored. And, and, and there's the tendency, I, I feel, in the world to then give them things to do and, and make them do things. But I think there's actually a lot of value in that boredom and in that, yeah, not knowing anything and indeed having a void to fill, that creates a lot of that creativity. And I've, I've, and it's hard as a parent because, of course, when they're bored, they're, they're annoying and they, they do lots of things, both to you, to the house, to, to their siblings. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's bad, but when they can get through that part, um, it, it really creates a lot more creativity. I also felt that when I was living for the first time on my own uh, as a student, uh, I, I didn't realize how hard it would be to be just alone. And in one sense, it, mm -hmm. it was hard. And I sometimes filled it with doing stuff just to be busy. But there was always some time to just be on your own and you just yeah enjoy. And I can, I can still, I don't do much practices, but I can still enjoy being the first or the last in, in the home to go to sleep or to get up and just to yeah be alone in, in an empty space, an empty house. And that indeed, a little bit like what you say, have a void to, to give space to that creativity. It's, uh, it's, it's wonderful. And when you say it drives me, uh, what I also hear is that you're, with with the, the practices that you are doing, uh, you are creating space for that void? Is that, is that how I should see it? I think so. And it's, it's not necessarily like space created geometrically, you know, out of an XYZ mm -hmm. axis or anything. It's observation of our living selves, the breath, the heartbeat, the things that we're actually thinking of as they slow down you know it's 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 uh it becomes peaceful <laughs> so I, I would say yeah it is a kind of a space but it's a space that kind of extends out from us it starts within us and it extends out and we suddenly you know are a part of this huge cosmos and and it's it's actually very peaceful because you know, um, we realize how small we are and how powerful we are all at once. And, and is that something you do since a long time? Is that something you discovered recently? How should I? Uh... No, I, I've been practicing a while. I, I started maybe 15 years ago doing Ashtanga yoga, which is very physical. And uh, not only with my age and other things, you know, I had to find other ways to grow because um, the physical yoga practices are pretty strenuous and our bodies change. So um, then I discovered um, other forms of energy work uh, called Kundalini yoga that, that focuses on internal energy and breath. And I still do the physical yogas. I just don't do them to the extent that I used to um, because I think that it's, it's okay. We want to use our physical selves as a, as a gateway to something greater and you know, for as long as my body allows me in this lifetime, I will be using my body to whatever full extent at any age that I can. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a, it's been a study of, of mine for a long time, different, different forms of, um, you know, knowing ourselves and um, knowing how to become very, very present in the moment. It, it's such a, it's such an art form. And I think different yoga teachers have made me aware of presence is a skill man it is a deep skill and i've seen people who've mastered it and, and i want more of that right and to be in every moment because it, it's kind of remarkable 
the present moment is the only real one you have control over and full agency over. Everything mm-hmm. else already happened or heck, we don't know if it's going to happen. But this very moment is the one where everything could happen. You know, all the possibilities are in the present. So it's, it's a, a very important thing to study, um, I think, is just how we connect with the present moment. And do, you, do you, it's been 15 years that you started it. Do you know what triggered you to start that? Um, stress relief. <laughs> I mean, many people do uh, the basic physical yogas for stress relief. They were remarkable. I mean, I could, like in the first few years of practice, I could at least make myself go from a high stress state to a back to a normal state. And over time, as I got better and better, I could actually, within a one hour class, put my bodily state into the feeling as if I had been on vacation a month and I, I can still do that. So it's, 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 it's very nice. It's very re- refreshing to be able to, to, to use that skill to bring myself into a good space. It, it, it sounds also like very efficient if you can in, in yes. one hour have to have the same effect as a one month uh, holiday. That's, that's very efficient. So it. um, uh, it, 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 it's a joke, but at the same time, I think there, there's sometimes companies that, that say, yeah, but yoga is that worldwide. Well, yes, if you can get that effect on, on the people that work for you in one hour, that's a very great effect that you can have. So even there, um, I'm, I, I'm not a fan of, of um, talking too much about the, the most efficient ways of doing things, but that's a way that I would say that that might be something yeah. where it, it actually um, is, is applicable and, and good. So that's, uh, but I was asking, not because I was expecting it, but yeah, I've seen many people moving in that direction for, for stress kind of things. And uh, so, yeah, it, it's then nice to see that, okay, for you, it completely worked and it helped you. Indeed, if you can have the effect of a one month holiday in, in a one hour, of course, that was not from the first lesson, I assume, but still yeah, you yeah. were able to, to learn that. So that's, um, it, it, takes, that is... it, takes, it takes work and continuous practice. It's like music. You can lo- lose it. So you have to always use it mm-hmm. and always find it again and reconnect with it. And so I'm doing it as much as I can, you know, um, because I think that for me, that's, that's a good state to be in because then I can... I can be a much more positive force um, in the universe and I can help others and be in a great place where I'm really listening rather than concerned with my own problems. <laughs> and, and, and you're in a state of constant holiday at the same time in, in ways. <laughs> Except for when I work when it goes up. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. But yeah, I, I, I do understand that brings yeah a lot of peace, peace of mind and, and peace and indeed uh, I've, I, I can definitely see that the impact will will be on on whatever you're doing. If either if it's in a private life and a professional life, it can have a huge impact. And that kind of brings me to that next question about impact. What do you consider your biggest achievement? And I, I realize when I ask this question, this this is kind of way to give you to to give you the. Um, um, permission to brag. So so my question behind the question is that, is that easy for you to brag about things? Is that something that is, that is, yeah, that is easy? Oh my gosh. That actually is kind of hard because uh, I, I feel like um, whatever about me is appealing, uh, it's going to sell on its own <laughs> or not. So it's sort of like in that agile mindset, you know, everything's an experiment and the successful experiment will indeed succeed (laughs) and become an achievement. Um, Gosh, that is a really tough one. You know, I I guess. um, I think, I don't know if it's an achievement that I would say, like I won this and that award and and so on and so forth, because those, those come and go. But I, I think the biggest achievement is, coming to a place in my life, career, and um, profession where I'm at peace 98% of the time that whatever's bad happening will pass and 
you know, just give it, give it some time. And, and I say this right now because I'm actually um, in transitioning. I'm, I'm transitioning between companies, uh, leaving a wonderful company of eight years. They had a merger and my role was eliminated. Um, and this time it was like, I just, it wasn't even a bad thing. I suddenly just flipped and flipped that narrative immediately and said, wow, this is, this is like, a kind of liberation too, because now, you know, many more possibilities are opened up. And so if, if there's a quote unquote achievement, I guess it's coming into the age of wisdom for myself and, and having enough experience uh, in life to see different patterns and not be too worried <laughs> about things, you know, because uh, it's, it's one thing and, and I do appreciate it. I mean, my um, family, we don't have young kids in the house anymore and this and that the other so it's also you know maybe there's a little bit less of an economic impact but you know even just the notion of you know will I be valuable uh, it in this you know with all this experience you could also say will there be age discrimination whatever those just aren't a big concern of mine because I guess I just keep doing what I'm doing practicing and learning and kind of, I think the poet Rumi said, whatever you are seeking is also seeking you. So that part of is also seeking me. It's going to happen. There's going to be some kind of good marriage between somebody who needs what I have and what I have to offer. So yeah, that, that piece of seeing things and, you know, I, I guess it's an important skill because when I look at the conditions in the world, that are really, really serious, not like just losing a job is a very first world problem. But when you look at the war in Ukraine, or when you look at, you know, polarization, hatred, extremism, that's the space that we're going to need really peaceful, firm people to come in and create a space for something new, right? Because you can't come in yelling, you can't come in with, you know, some kind of dogmatic approach. Um, this kind of thing requires understanding and untangling, you know, and, and letting, unfortunately, we got to let some of that expression of anger and whatever is going through people's mind come out. But, you know, it's, it's going to be kind of work from all angles, you know, to, to stop war is a difficult thing from a political angle. But when we look at each of our individual actions, one of the greatest powers we have is cessation. We can cease at any time to be doing something harmful. So if every single soldier who doesn't believe a war is just ceases and puts down his or her weapon, that is the power of the collective deciding, right? So maybe we can appeal to people one by one in a peaceful way to apply the power of cessation appropriately where it needs to be applied. That is a very strong thing we each have is, is to stop things. <laughs> wow. That's, that's, yeah. It, it, there's so many things going in, into my head at the first time. At, 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 uh, first of all, let's talk about the achievement. Yes, I do consider it a big achievement if you can be in a space where you don't worry about it because you feel like, okay, things will happen. Um, I, I can imagine that uh, many people lost their jobs in, in, the, in the past months because we've seen it in many places. Um, that not everybody is in that space and that's no blame on them. It's just, it's more the achievement is on your side that, okay, you've came to a point in life where you, of course, you've seen it. You've been to some of these things. You've seen people around you getting, getting things. Okay. And I really like also that you pointed back to, okay, it's a first life, a first world problem, because if you lose a life, if you lose a friend, if you lose, if there is a war going on, where do you lose so much things? That's so much bigger than than just a job. Um, that's uh, that is indeed very powerful. Um, yeah, I have some friends in Ukraine. I've been to the the conference, the Agile conference in Ukraine. I have spoken with many people, and yeah, it, it, it's hard to connect with them because they they uh, of course I can't ask every week how is it going because they want to keep going and 
and you see how and I've, I've people that work with people in Ukraine and then they just, they continue working and then in the middle of a meeting, they say, oh, there is an attack. I need to go to the shelter. I'll, I'll talk back to you in, in half an hour. And I'm like, okay, that, that's, that's kind of insane to live like that, but that's their, their world at this moment. Um, and I think there's a lot of them for them that is similar to what you say. They they kind of stop worrying at, about the other part, like okay, what can I do best to make my life and the life of the people around me better? Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, I, I I would never condemn anybody for doing what they feel is the right thing to do. Um, and I I have no idea what it must be like to to be on the front in Ukraine. It is an interesting thing, though, when I think about war in general, removing it just from Ukraine, you know, it's sort of like the notion of winning and losing is a very strange notion because it sort of assumes that once we quote unquote win, it'll be this frozen trophy in the sky that, you know, we can, we, we like we won, hooray. And yet, you know, it, it's, um, I think some of the, uh, like um, Tish Hot Nan, uh, He's a, a well-known Zen Buddhist of the Plum Village, and, and he says that, you know, there is no living and there is no dying. There is on, only continuation, right? And <laughs> that one is really powerful to me because it, it's sort of like, even when you hold up that trophy and say we won, life continues, right? And so mm -hmm. what are we, when we think about the continuation beyond the artificial punctuation we put into some historical event, what does that really mean? <laughs> because what we're going to end up with, and it's true whether it was, you know, with my family in China at the Cultural Revolution or whatever, is as we destroy each other and destroy everything we've created, we'll be left with nothing. And maybe that's a part of why we're doing it. I don't know. But it, it's kind of like the more we destroy, when, when that end point comes and we declare that we've won, we still have to continue. <laughs> Yeah, and if you just look at, at yeah the pictures of, of Ukraine at this moment, there's like so many things have been destroyed. So independent of who wins, that country is still is destroyed and there is so much thing. And, and I'm just talking about art, but also about yeah just trees, about buildings, about a lot of things. Uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's insane. Um, and then, yeah, there is no, well, everybody's losing in this kind of thing. There, there will yes, be, yes. At, at some point, someone says, I won. I'm not even sure because a lot of the wars, the last years, there's this taking on for years and then there's no really a winner or a loser. Uh, but everybody wins and uh, loses in, in, in all of these things. That's, um, that's how it feels at least. Thanks for, for sharing that because it's indeed making us think about that. And I, I on purpose don't want people to think or don't say this is, this is the kind of achievement you need to think about. And I really like that, that you bring in another kind of achievement that most people won't even think about. So it's a, it's a very, for me, powerful way of, of thinking about achievements. Being in a state where you can actually say, okay, bad things happen around me or I lose a job, but at the same time, I don't worry too much. That's uh, that's very zen at, at the same time, but it's, it's also, yeah, it's, it's, it's a state where you're in. So that's a, a nice achievement. I want to move to that next question. Do you have, and I think you shared already some things, but is there anything, a personal agility tip that, that you want to share with people? Gosh, um... A personal agility tip. Um, keep learning. <laughs> I think our community exemplifies that. But but uh, wow, that's that's uh, you know that's what draws me to the community and all the wonderful people in it. I had a chance to look at all the lovely people that you have in your podcast, and some of them I know, some of them I don't. So I'm eager to get to know them through your podcast. But one defining thing that I've seen again and again is our willingness to learn and, and, and kind of not hold dogmatically to some of our ideas. At least, you know, there's a good portion of us who, who would be that way. And I think that's so important because, you know, it, it's, it's first of all, very stressful to, to, to hold yourself to dogma because it's likely gonna be supplanted by something else. But on, 
I think that, you know, when we hold dogma, we sort of create a defensive shell around ourselves and we don't allow the ideas of other people to come in. And I've learned so much from other people that, you know, I, I, I'm constantly at their feet, just in awe of, thank you very much. You know, you've, you've given me a whole different angle or you approach it differently, or even if it's similarly, you see it through a different lens and that helps me. So keep learning, keep learning. <laughs> I really like that. And that's, I, I agree our, our community is about learning. Uh, it's, it's the, for me, there's when, when we talk about, okay, people and interactions over processes and tools. Well, yeah, it, it, the tools and the processes, they, they, these are where the dogmas are, and this is where we want to keep improving and finding it. And I think that there is no community that has so many processes and so many tools because we keep learning. And you might look at it in a negative way, like, oh, we invented too much. And like, yeah, but we, we kind of worked and learned what, what works in a certain uh, situation. And of course, like you said earlier on, situations are different inside your country, inside some of the companies that you work with. And you already know that the next company you're going to work in, you can reuse some of the things you've learned. And at the same time, you will learn new things. That's just, yeah, it's, there's no other thing. And for me, that is that is where, where a lot of the value is. The value in Agilist is about, I'm a person that can learn other things. You want and to I add something. From each other, you know, because... I really appreciate the people who can create a model for us to operate on, right? I mean, those models are not meant to be total truths. I mean, I, I really like one of the um, teachers at the Santa Fe Institute, he's a professor, and he said, uh, models are like caricatures, right? They give you an essence that delineates some form. <laughs> it's like a caricature, but it doesn't really fill in all the richness of, of any single phenomena. And so, we have different models and as long as we understand that they are caricatures and to be used as ways to guide and not as truth, then I think, you know, we'll be able to get somewhere. So, and, and I really, I mean, I love all the people that create different kinds of models for us to work with. I mean, I've always said, you know, I, I embrace all these different frameworks, less and scrum at scale and safe and because they're all models that are being constantly developed and iterated. And as long as we don't take them as cardinal truth, I think it's okay, you know, because we, we need sort of somebody to say, this is roughly what it looks like. Do you think this model will help you, right? And, and I think uh, that's important that we stay very open to that, right? And I think some of the more powerful, not agile models necessarily, although used by agile is Kinevin, right? Because I think Snowden himself calls it a decision framework and sense a sense-making framework of what kind of context we're in. Very powerful, again, a very powerful framework. So, um, but I, I take each of these people as kind of little gems of a truth and um, partial truth or whatever you want to call it or synthesized truth. But, you know, we, we certainly don't want to stick to one thing. I think we want to hear the different things people have to come up with. <laughs> I really like the way you bring it. And unfortunately, what I see in most companies when they go to a certain model is they think that they, they see it much more as the one truth. And now we're going to apply yes. this model everywhere. And that's yeah. the exact opposite is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. I, I have, yeah. I actually, I have, I have a story that I do like to share about Pacific Life. And we've shared it multiple times. So when I started there eight years ago, when we started to introduce agility, I had one and only one rule as a leader, which is there will be no canonical model, no single canonical model that guides mm -hmm. us. You can learn about everything you want, but I'm not gonna say this is a safe shop. This is a less shop. This is a scrum at scale shop. This is a business agility framework shop, right? Because there's too much there to learn and there are common threads in it all. But the second we try to kind of cookie cutter into an organization that's at a different place in evolution, even between all of its groups and organizational parts, we, we can really mess things up. So, you know, that's where some of the natural agility and the organic practices come in, which is you gotta learn your environment. Like, am I in Southern California where it's very dry and the soil is clay by nature 
and or am I in you know somewhere in near the Mississippi River where the soil is rich and moist and you know has a bunch of living organisms in it you know you, you gotta really look at the environment and so I think biologists have taught me and farmers have taught me a lot more about being a good agilist than I would say a framework ever did. <laughs> And I would I would assume that the way they applied the, the the things that they've learned much more than than yeah because I assume also farmers have some kind of models that uh, that they use at some point but like you say well if they try something and if it doesn't work well of course then they they drop it I, I think that's a very logical uh, thing to do. Um, in an organization, it might also take a while until we see what what's working and what's not working. But mm -hmm. it's it's very tempting. Sorry, when when you see people going for an organization a transformation, they say, "Oh, we're going to make it easy. We're going all to apply the same thing." Yeah, but mm -hmm. how, where is the value in there? And 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 doesn't work then everywhere. And and I can see you can you might need a starting point, but. Like you say, it's very good to say, let's not all go for the exact same thing. We can inspire people with something yeah. and then see where we can go. Um, yeah, and, and I think the conflict we run into is that with embedded into certainly our Western economic system against, say, equity and stock growth within a public company, everybody has a timeline to become agile, right? And yet, when I look at this, I'm like, boy, if there's gonna be a stumbling block, it's sort of trying to attribute a certain speed um, to something that we want as an outcome so that we can report the results and it will aggregate into financial results. You know, that's the biggest mistake we can make because the actual human system is not gonna change in that way, right? And so when we study kind of like how companies measure currently mostly on economic output and economic growth, and then we try to say agility is going to tighten that ship even more. And by the way, we want it by second quarter. That's just going to create a bunch of trouble, in my opinion, my humble opinion. Yeah, and I, th I think we've seen it already, uh, I think, in farming. I mean, if you, if you look back at what, what happened there, and I see a lot of bigger and bigger farms because economically it made sense. Yes. But like you said, then, then it's very easy to say, okay, let's put some chemicals because this will give a better result this year. But we forget that in 10 years, the, the, the ground the, the, is, is oh, not good I'm, anymore. I I will tell you, um, I have spent a good deal of time attending farmer conferences because they have taught me so much. But what's remarkable about um, Lindley and Dave at the um, Real Organics Project is they are trying to get exactly what you said out there to people for them to understand. The consolidation in US agricultural um, companies is very similar in pattern to tech company consolidation. There are basically about five companies that run it all now. And as a result, wow. um, yeah, I, I didn't know this either until I got the people who were experts and they, they literally have these like consolidation, like um, kind of topologies that show how everything rolls up to these five large agricultural conglomerates. And as a result, we no longer are caring for the soil and our animals live in a horribly inhumane condition. I think it's a little better in Europe. We're now partnering with, an, or Real Organics is partnering with um, a group in Germany now because there are people that are starting to see this, but we as eaters, uh, that's what I am. I'm an eater, I'm not a farmer. We should, you know, it, it was so important for me to learn this because who would have known that, you know, every single consumer decision we make, certainly in the United States, is likely to be part of one of five large um, farming conglomerate companies, right? Their names are not as well known as Google and everything, but they are known to farmers and it is putting small farmers simply out of business, you know, that, and it's, it's horrible to see all these family farms disappear. And more importantly, the sustainable ways of um, farming are disappearing and we're turning into a big polluting, uh, petrochemical <laughs> system. Yeah, that that that's the thing that worries me most ab about it. Uh, and yeah, if if there w in a in a way, if it's one 
or one of these five agglomerates would doing it in a better way that is much sustainable, then I would worry a little bit less. But unfortunately, and we've seen it in all kinds of industries, once you're at that level of size, people don't think anymore about the, the ground and everything that we're, why we're doing it for at that level. It's much more about, about the business and about the numbers and about whatever that there is. And I assume that, or I think, and maybe it's an assumption, but I think it's, yeah, well, at least I have the feeling it's right that the top people in these kind of companies, they might have never worked on a farm and don't understand how a farm works and everything. I hope it's not true, but, but unfortunately, I, I, I feel that if, if you are at, at this kind of level, just like in some of the other tech companies that, and, and, and banks and insurance companies, we have people at the top that are there and are really good for business. And, and that's not bad per definition, but at least then they should understand what's below, what is their business, uh, yeah. much more than just the numbers. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think it's so important because what we eat, we eat every day. And so we buy food to eat. And so the simple question for each of ourselves to ask is, are the things that I buy at the grocery store life affirming or actually kind of life hurt, hurting life in this way? And it's just a basic question. Nobody's being condemned here, but it's something that I've started to really take a look at and try my best to support um, smaller farms. I go to the farmer's market and, you know, and I'm not saying that the efficiency of large companies is a bad thing, but certainly in the United States, there's very, very blatant greenwashing where, you know, um, there's m much more funding to the large conglomerates than there ever is to the small, um, the small family farms. And it's all under this label of like climate smart. And so, you know, it just, it, the, the greenwashing goes on and on. It's, it's pretty astounding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, and I find it, like you say, we want to make that decisions when we buy food, but at the same time, it's almost impossible to know where that food came from and what happened with it and, and, and if it's actually coming from a, a small farmer or from a big one. The chances are much more that it's coming from a big one than from a smaller one. So it's, it's not always easy to, to make these kind of decisions. So it's, uh, so thanks for sharing that, that information because I had no, I knew that it, it's, it's, it's bad that it's not, that it's just the number of companies, but I had no idea it was just five. That's, that's enormous or that's very little for the enormous country yeah. that you have. Wow. Okay, let's move to that uh, next question. That next one is about remote work. And I, I wonder, did you, um, we're now talking remote, but did, for example, did you work remote before COVID? Were you already working some kind of way remote? No. So is there anything that you've learned in the past years that you want to share? Um, I think in remote working, actually, we need a heightened sense awareness of self-care because uh, let's all kind of dial back to March 2020 when the pandemic started and suddenly everyone was forced to be home. And so it was very easy to spend 10 to 12 hours <laughs> online doing things because suddenly, you know, you felt that nobody can see me, therefore I have to be doing a lot and I have to be online, right? And and soon we learned that uh, that was very, very unhealthy. And so I think uh, finding new rhythms is, is kind of a theme about remote working, which is I, I do like rhythm and I do like cadence. And that's, that's part of agility, too, is like and it's part of music, you know, is that when there is a rhythm, we tend to stay on track. It's not to say you can't reinvent the song. <laughs> you can't reinvent the meter. But it's important to stay um, on track. And so, you know, even in this period, as I look for jobs, I have a cadence and I follow that as religiously as possible. You know, my own daily scrum or whatever you want to call it. But um, I, I do that because it's, a, it's, it's healthy. And what I find is that we operate on rhythms um, because nature dictates it. The sun comes up and down. And so there are rhythms that our body is uh, naturally attuned to. So that, that's what I've learned for, from, for remote working now is with kind of in some ways greater autonomy for our time, 
we it becomes necessary to really be thoughtful, be thoughtful about where we give our time and attention and then try to keep certain cadences that are helpful to us. Wow, and that's well, that's that's almost another agility tip, and and at the same time, I think indeed, it is. Uh, I I recognize a lot um, for the people that were working were forced to be at home and and during COVID, a lot of people were were struggling with what is my rhythm, and 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 now I see the opposite. Now a lot of people can go back to the office, and I was like, hey, wait a minute, but I found a much better rhythm in the last two three years. And now you're forcing me back to the office, but I actually thought about it and, and found a rhythm that is maybe even better for me than, than before. Uh, and for some, it's like, no, no, I really like to go back to the rhythm that I was at in the office. And there's, again, like you said earlier on, there's no blaming in other country. It's nothing that this is better or that's better, but it's really about finding the rhythm that works for you. Um, yes. And I... And I see that, well, I, I have uh, someone who's at university right now and he's yeah, discovering whatever rhythm that works for him. And that's definitely a rhythm that is not at the same level that we are in, in our family. And, and yeah, it, I think it's important, but it, it's at the same time, it's hard as a family to think about, okay, how do we deal with that? How do we let him explore what rhythm is, is working for him? And, and what is working for our family and how do we integrate these things. And I think it's it's really important to give time and space to people to find their rhythm. Yeah, yeah. What works for them. And, and a rhythm is sort of, when you think about rhythm musically, right, it's so lovely in that rhythms create unison. Okay, mm -hmm. so whatever we decide is our rhythm. There's no group actually that can function well without a rhythm, <laughs> okay? And it's certainly true of an orchestra. Uh, or a choir, but I think that uh, fundamentally that's why rhythm is important is that um, that's one way in which we find togetherness. So yeah, this can be a very fun period of exploring different rhythms and uh, you know finding new ones and it's probably gonna change a lot in the next three to five years because we're still kind of figuring out this next normal thing that we're all gonna be doing post COVID. <laughs> But I, I really like that you bring it also back again to music. Of course, rhythm is about music or music is about rhythm. But also when, when I think about music, for me, um, you can be in a band and multiple people can play different rhythms that actually work nice together. And that's, that's a very nice analogy for what we're dealing with now, right now is that in the sense that yeah, some people have some certain rhythm, other people have other kind of rhythm, and you need to, yeah, you make you need to make a way that you can dance basically to the music and say, okay, what works as a whole? And and I think that is and this is what I think you you alluded to for the next three, four years. Yeah, some people have have said, Oh, I found a different rhythm and this is how I'm trying to make it work uh in this new world, in this new normal. Uh, and some people want to go back to the old rhythm because they they like that and 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 I see that that's a similar thing with music eh? when there is a new music genre invented, some people like to stay with the old genre and the the other people say, "No, I like the new one more and uh, and and some people like well for me, for example, I like multiple kind of music, so it's like, not like I prefer one thing it's like no, don't give me the same music for the rest of my life, give me different kind of musics." Yes, yes. And I think, uh, you know, maybe what we're describing, I, I think there's all different forms of music, but certainly the one with the greatest degree of improvisation that I can think of at the moment is jazz, right? Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing about jazz is um, that I hear from jazz musicians is that even with the high degree of improvisation, there are basic forms, right? So when people say we're going to do this number at this meter, that form is known by everybody. And then within that form, there's room for personal expression, right? And classical music, the interpretation's tighter. There's not as much room for complete improvisation, although Bach would probably think he was improvising every time he built a new theme on an invention or whatever he was doing. But um, yeah, I think that uh, it is interesting how groups can play music together. 
and how we can still find a lot of latitude for our little personal flourishes <laughs> within mm -hmm. the, the, the piece, right? Yeah, and, and when you talk about classical music, I think most orchestras and whatever that play classical music, if you see two different orchestras or a different conductor, it will feel completely different, even if it's the same piece. Yes. Because they, they have a different kind of feel. And, and yeah, so there is always some, some difference. And again, yes, it's it's the same sheet of music that they think they're playing, but that their conductor will will move it a little bit in in one way or another, and so that's that's also part of music and rhythm. And okay, it adapts to the people who are playing in a, in a sense. I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I once thought about like if you looked at the different agile frameworks, which ones would be more of certain kinds, be more representative of a type of music, right? And, mm. and when I think about sort of natural agility, I might think about jazz. And when I think about scaled agile framework, I might think about classical music because there's a conductor, maybe a PMO leader or something. So, you know, I had fun kind of playing with like, what kind of music would that agile be? <laughs> wow. It's, yeah, that, that'd be really, really fun to think about what music would what part be and then... Um... Yeah, think about uh, well, well, what is what is that indeed that jazz piece, or what is a punk music, or what is I don't know what is techno music in 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 our industry. That that might be interesting to look at. <laughs> so uh, if people have uh, feel inspired, they can put things into the comments here and and see if yeah. they, they have some ideas. I would really like to hear what uh, they think about what kind of music is or what kind of agile framework is what kind of music that would be a fun thing to talk about yeah 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 <laughs> okay uh i want to move to um uh one of the questions that i i really look forward with you because you already talked about multiple kind of things uh that are similar um what's a book that you have read and or that you're busy reading that you want to talk about oh wow i am woman of books so i'm I'm, I, I give myself a rule, though. I can never be reading more than two in parallel. <laughs> so, But I think right now, truly, um, I'm immersed in complexity science. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of really good books. Uh, but if we're interested in kind of an overview of complexity, Melanie Mitchell's um, book. That's the book, huh? Yes, A Guided Tour. She, she, she helps explain it at a level. Well, this book was developed as a series of talks to the public. Now, it must have been a very, very, very intelligent public because some of the stuff is whoo, over my head, certainly. But, but it is, um, it's a good start because she really lays it out. And I think for our audience, particularly those interested in technology and computation, she herself is a PhD in computer science with an expertise in complexity. So. And she does wow. a really good job explaining it. Um, but I think what's nice about that book is she starts out with this story that will really interest Agilist, I think, about ants, right? These colonies of ants are each individual brains within this greater system, and they get work done together. And no one, no um, biologist has been able to crack how it is that they manage to get tons of work done, whether it's building you know, their, their, their um, home structure underground or whether it is foraging for food, there is clearly this notion of independent decision makers, which are individual ants, doing collective things. So this is a very interesting question, you know, about complex systems is that each individual agent somehow knows what to do, right? And, and so she starts out the, the whole book with this analogy about complexity and how it is not necessarily predictable, but each agent has some degree of choice, and yet things happen together. You know, whether we there is no big room planning that happens with the end. No, 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 no. And there's no leader. Maybe you have like you know a queen bee or a queen ant, but it's it's not. You know, there's no like they don't all stop and get their whiteboards out and say what are we going to do for the next quarter, right? They somehow know in their in their survival, you know, what to do. So that's just a nice, I think it's a really nice way. 
I think for leaders to engage in maybe a type of complexity and organizational trust, that what if we allowed all the wonderful people in our organization to make decisions, would we end up with doing the right thing naturally without necessarily having to do huge plans all the time? I don't know the answer to that, but it's very intriguing because um, I think when you look at complex adaptive systems, that's the question is how much of it is planned versus how much of it emerges from the collective structure, right? So she gets into a little bit, um, there's one chapter, and, and this is where my, my studies are a little deeper, on um, one dimension of complexity that tries to look at the mathematics of complexity. It's called dynamical systems. And I'm taking an introduction course right now from um, the Santa Fe Institute. Um, and what I find so interesting is that uh, in that class, we take some basic equations that might model population growth and other things, right? And we start with initial values. And then we take the output of the function and we plug it back in and we keep iterating and iterating. And what's really interesting about some of these um, equations, like the population models, is that there are periods as you move time t out to infinity, there are periods where there's very clear values that naturally emerge from the system. So like, let me give you an example, like a, a period two system would, you know, emerge to two values very naturally and a period four system would emerge to, to four. And in between those periods, there are these periods of chaos where there's no single value the system itself lands on, right? Mm -hmm. And so what's really interesting is, I guess the takeaway that I had is there's still some order in modeled chaos. Um, and what, what he ends up showing in this course is kind of as time t moves out to infinity, you have these different segments of clear periods and chaos and clear periods and chaos. And what um, Mitchell Feigenbaum, this physicist discovered, um, I think it was in the 70s or 80s, is that the mathematical ratio between those various periods gravitates toward a single constant. That's so cool. It's like, wow. it's universal. Yeah, that's like, that was kind of mind blowing to me. And, and, and that, I'm gonna bring it back home to Agile because it, it goes to this notion of, if we can model systems that, so, and start with certain initial conditions, if we let those systems just run, would they gravitate toward universal constants? In other words, would they find some kind of working method or would they gravitate toward equilibrium in this natural way? I don't know. I mean, I'm not as smart as these people, but that did make me ask the question. And it did make me wonder even more about why we try to force methods and processes on systems that may actually be fine on their own. You know, they just might be. So it was kind of like all this, you know, engagement with the organic farming and music and then regenerative economics, which we didn't even get to. I needed like, are there people exploring whether or not this is mathematically true? And sure enough, there were. And I think those are just some ideas about how much we yet have to learn about this beautiful universe that we live in is maybe there is just order that comes out of the void I, I don't know. And, and I think many of the, the smartest people, the smartest minds in the Santa Fe Institute may not know the answer either. But man, are we after, you know, understanding this better and, 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 and asking ourselves. So it comes back to me as an agile is saying, how much do I really have to force? Or how much yeah. do I let it happen? And then take my observations of the system and show it to the people in the system and say, by the way, you look like this. It's, it's working beautifully, you know? So, so it's, I, I don't know, I don't know. It's just, it has led to this explosion. And so in this conference in two weeks that I'm gonna be talking at, I'm bringing in all these adjacent communities because I think they have a lot of meaning to Agilists because we've been, we've been dancing around this, but we, we haven't necessarily had the language to try to explain this phenomena that we're, you know, um, dancing around. <laughs>
It, I, I really love it because indeed what what you say is that sometimes in companies you have people who want to stabilize systems and what I'm hearing is that actually a lot of these systems stabilize themselves and I can definitely see that that sometimes things look are very stable and then there's others that say you see that system it's stable so we should be stable as well and it's like maybe not maybe it's we let we should let the chaos run until it finds its natural stability and I think that's yeah I don't know enough about about physics and others, but I can definitely see that that there is some things that they try to let go, and then things things work yeah. out fine yeah. on on their own. Uh, I I know that my I think it's my dad who used to tell me a story about um, when they wanted to have solar planets in in space that um, they've been trying for so they had to, the for the space station or whatever that was. They had uh, solar panels and they, they should fold out because, of course, it's, it's originally in a rocket, so it should fold out. And they tried multiple ways on, on with springs, with all kinds of things to make sure how could we fold it out that it, that it doesn't break and always troubles. And at some point, somebody said, what if we don't do anything? What if we don't add anything? And, and, and it, it, it cracked, it It makes a lot of sound, but it was no problem at all. So they have been trying to solve a problem that was not a problem at all. And it's, it looks very yes. similar to what you've been saying. Yes. Sometimes we want to control things. And yes, maybe things crack a little bit, make a lot of noise. Because yeah, when, when you, I don't know, whatever that they did. Uh, I have no idea how, how true that story is. Because it's, I, it's something I've heard like 10, 15 years yeah. ago. Uh, but it, it's I, I can so see it in front of me because we see so much that people try to optimize in ways and standardize in ways, and then you say, well, if you can just let it go, if you can let go of the control, actually, things will but, figure it out. Yeah, and I know people get afraid when we say that because it sounds like, ah, oh, we're just going to let it go wild, and the roller coaster is going to fall off the rails. But it's really about a notion of collective wisdom. If we let everybody make the best decisions they can make with the information they have, with the best curiosity and the best frame of mind, will it work out in a good way, right? And and I think that's where it's like, you know, I, I, I've always been kind of a um, an advocate and don't meddle with it, learn it and understand it, and then it'll find its own, you know, it'll find itself, find itself. But you know, every time we bring in this framework idea and we try to impose it on an organization, that is meddling because we're not really understanding all the people in it and their concerns and, and how, how they, they might actually solve the, the problem or, or they might even not, not even view it as a problem, right? And so I think it is, it is very hard when we talk about uh, VUCA, right, the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and uh, amb ambiguity, right? All these executives are trying to get their arms around VUCA, and maybe it's sort of just like step back and see and guide the collective wisdom. I'm not saying leaders don't have a place, but can we guide the collective wisdom in the sense that we help the system see itself better so that it makes better decisions, right? And and and, and I think um, that's so important. And and that's just something that I was really privileged at Pacific Life to have a team of people who were willing to experiment and the system kind of guided its way forward in that sense, right? Um, so uh, yeah, that was a great experience. Uh, the, the, the no frameworks rules was a good rule <laughs> to set out at the very beginning. <laughs> I really like that, and and I I really like what you said about okay, it, it's about the autonomous people that are smart enough, and we we should much more. I think, and I fully agree. Uh, leaders have a role in there, and we just need to figure, and the people need to figure out. And for me, one of the things is that they should teach the people below what. If you take a decision, why would you take a decision, and make sure that the people understand what parts are important about that decision. And and it, for me, it, it reminds me a lot about yeah. If you grow children, when you when you teach them, when you when you yeah, when you help them, I as a parent, I can take all decisions, but that won't help my children. I think it's much better to teach them about some of the reasons why. And sometimes on whatever day, 
there, there might be that I say, okay, I'm not going to explain. We don't have the time for whatever and for safety reasons or whatever. But in general, most of the days I should spend much more with teaching the children about, okay, this is why I want to go in that direction. And of course, at the level of, of their understanding. And I think yes, that's the yes. same in, in organizations. Let's teach the people at their level of understanding what they know about what is a good decision and let them figuring it out a little bit like your ants. And I have indeed, we haven't figured out how that works with ants, but um, um, we haven't figured out how it works with people as well. We need to just, uh, the thing is with ants, we can, they trust each other and it works. We need to trust it with people, even if we haven't figured out all the details anymore that's, uh, or yet. Uh, that, that's part of the thing for me. It's much more about figuring out how to let go than figuring out how to control. Yes, yes. That's what we're all learning. <laughs> and, and it's hard. I mean, I, I think the example I always give is I, we all want our children to think for themselves, except at uh, seven in the morning when we want to get ready to go to school and we want them to go. <laughs> Yeah, that, yeah. That, then it's annoying if they think for themselves and don't want to do whatever you prepared or whatever. It's like, no, it, it's hard. It's hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and we all, well, most of us, we go, go uh, good out of that phase and we, yeah, it, we don't sleep enough and whatever. But at the same time, most families survive this in, in a more or less yes, healthy yes. way. Okay, I want to move to, uh, and, and this is one where I'm really interesting with everything you said already, this question about, okay, what do, we, do you think I should also ask you? Uh, is there a question that I didn't ask you? And, and of course, what's the answer there? Oh my gosh, is there a question you didn't? You covered a lot of ground here today. Um, hmm. I guess, I guess, honestly, we, you know, since it's probably, it, it might be toward the end, I'm guessing by that question, we could ask uh, yeah. you know, what my hope for humanity was <laughs> or something. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Okay, and that's, that's indeed, it, it's very much in tie with the rest of the conversation. So what is that hope that you have? Um, well, I guess the thing is, it comes down to more basic things, you know. Uh, I hope that we learn to respect, honor, and love one another. <laughs> and uh, I, I like, um, so it, at the kids' school, we have this little song in their standard repertory called, If You're Going to Expect Respect, right? And, and the lyrics, uh, I won't sing the whole song, but it's, uh, if you're going to expect respect, you've got to show a little kindness. Right, and so um, it's about if you're going to expect respect, you got to show a little kindness. I think that's a great lesson for all of us. It's one of my favorite kid singer songs, and I love singing it with them because um, it reminds me that uh, if we want to be respected, we, we need to show kindness. I think that's a very well. First of all, it's it's great that we teach children, but it it would also be really good to do leaders because that's. <laughs> Yeah, the yeah, leaders or they 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 sometimes they feel like you should be respecting me. Yeah, but, but by shouting and by by whatever. And we've seen a few examples, I think, in in politics lately. Well, first of all, also in the U.S., but I think also uh, yes. everything that the wars that are going on, there is not much respect and kindness that people are are doing. Um, and yeah. And at the same time, and then it goes back to what you said earlier, it's really hard to be kind to people who are not kind and find a way, okay, how could we go into that conversation? Because, of course, we don't want to be kind to a bully and then be bullied even more. We want to make sure that we we somehow put the, the um, what is it, the boundaries and say, okay, this is so far, but if you respect that boundary, then, then I, I can stay again on the kindness side and, and make sure yeah, that we, yeah. we can have a conversation. Um, yeah, being, that is the toughest thing. Yeah. It's really I, the I think, thing to do, but, but I, I, I'm reminded that um, if I don't show kindness 
to somebody else, I'm actually creating more hatred in the world. And so, you know, um, even for some unnamed politician that used to head the United States that I won't say, I um, have to work on myself to find some connection, some human connection, so that I don't create more hatred when I think about it. <laughs> and and that, that is, yeah, going again about, that's probably even harder than what we just discussed. Uh, that's, that's, yeah, really for people that it's having, because that's indeed that, that humanness and that kindness that we're talking about uh, is that, yeah, still seeing it and that, that's for me is also the only way to get out of that black and white discussion yeah. that that, yeah. that is there is that if you can show respect even for the opponent that might be behaving badly at some points okay we can say okay that's the boundary for the behavior but at the same time i still respect you as a person and and because it it for me it and of course i i i I'm not a psychologist and I don't know anything, but for me, it shows a lot that most of these people that behave that way haven't seen enough kindness in their life and haven't seen yes. that kind of thing. And that's, yes. that's where I think it's we should absolutely move true. More. And I, I'll, I'll build on that by saying, when I think of somebody that is spewing hatred into the world, one exercise I do in my mind is I say, can you picture that person as an innocent child before they might have been harmed before they saw something that might have been traumatic, you know, that's that that suddenly, you know, does create a lot more forgiveness. And since I work, I work with school age kids, you know, I, I, I do see that there were moments maybe aggregated in their life where they didn't see enough kindness. But everybody, you know, somehow, it might be impossible and hard. But there was a moment when they could have um, I think not gone down a path that they ended up on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and and of course it's hard in retrospect to change that. And and yeah, and I I think that's true for most people. Maybe not for maybe there is this little one little percent or less or one hundredth of a percent that that's not true that they were whatever. But even there, something triggered these kind of people at some point so that's uh, definitely something and but talking we've been talking now about the bad people or people that we we have some less affinity to and i want to move it in the other kind of direction um which is the exact opposite what's a person that you think i should uh, should invite next and what's a person that you think okay wow there are so many awesome people in our community but there is one woman right now, since we've been talking so much about peace and kindness, I would really like to see if we can get Lorraine Aguilar to come on the show. I think uh, that's her, right? Yes, that is her. Look at her. Oh, my God. That is so Lorraine. She is wonderful. And uh, she is an expert in nonviolent communication. And... Mm. Um, she has had the pleasure of facilitating different organizations. Uh, and I'm saying this uh, obviously with her permission because it's on her website, like the United Nations and the Federal Reserve. Uh, I think Microsoft wow. is on her website. So she works directly with leaders and works on nonviolent communication in whatever, you know, a manifestation it needs to be taught in, in the different organizations. But uh, she is not only a great friend of mine, she lives in Southern California, uh, we um, attend Agile open spaces together, and we also like to sing and play music together. So that's another love of hers. So I, I would recommend it. And she's she's somebody who uh, can help um, help us see peace in a different way. <laughs> that, well, if if you can do nonviolent communications at the United Nations, I assume that they. Well, at least the United Nations themselves, they have to um, uh, use it in multiple kind of ways. So uh, if she's teaching them, I assume that, uh, yeah, she has some uh, really good ways of working with leaders to make them see some of these things. Uh, so that's uh, definitely, and I, it really ties into the rest of our conversation about bringing all these kind of things together. And I really like it because, uh, well, for me, um, there is something that I've been organizing for more than 10 years that's called uh, Coach Camp, where we practice 
uh, a full day with coaching so on um, for me I would I'm not even calling it coaching techniques it's more like communication techniques and nonviolent communication is indeed one of these things that we're we're sometimes friend depending on on what day we don't always practice all these things but it's definitely one of the things that uh, that my co-founder Oana Junku really wanted to get into it because and I, I agree with her it, it's so good to actually have people learn much more skills about nonviolent communication. It's, yes. uh, so yeah. thank you for, for inviting her. I think this is going to be a really fun talk as well, just as much as I enjoyed uh, our conversation. We've been talking for a very long time. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit less, but this is really uh, a really uh, wonderful conversation, a really wonderful way to, to spend my evening. So, if Colleen, if people want to get in touch with you, what could be the best way? Uh, I think. Um, well, um, let me see. I think LinkedIn is probably the easiest way. Uh, I don't really. I uh, that, that yeah, should there, be your link. Yeah, I, I, LinkedIn is the best way because. Uh, after Twitter sort of disintegrated, I, 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 I'm not on it as much. <laughs> and then Instagram, I really only reserve for family, uh, like 13 people. My, I keep track of, you know, my stepson and my nieces that way. <laughs> yeah. I, I do understand. And yes, indeed, uh, I've, I've stopped preparing Twitter for the exact same reason, I think. Uh, <laughs> yes. And I, I kind of depending on what day it is and I might use it a little more at conferences but other than that I've noticed in myself I'm using it a lot less these days so um, yeah um, yeah but but LinkedIn is indeed I think is also how we got uh, connected and, yes, and that's yes. how we and got I this conversation so. wanted to thank you so much for your time and your attention to this it was such a pleasure to meet you and talk with you and I look forward to more offline communications about what you're doing in Belgium and uh, in the European space so it's wonderful thank you so much you're, you're welcome well I, I, I decided this and let, let's share it I think may, I've shared it already multiple times here is that uh, for me uh, I've, I've, it's, it's, it was a conscious decision to say this year or actually last year to uh, not go too much to conferences outside Belgium um, to say okay but but then I still want to connect to people in in and either connect to the people that have not met before uh, but also find a way to connect and make new friends so this is why uh, one of the reasons why i did this um this also means that right now at this moment i'm not planning to go outside Belvoir, outside benelux because that's really small um to conferences but definitely in a couple of years uh, maybe even next year i will uh, i will go again uh, a little bit broader and, and connect and for you the same thing if for whatever reason you you're interested in Visiting Belgium, if you're doing something in Belgium, feel free to connect and we can, uh, we can uh, have a conversation. Yes. So, uh, well, if you ever take your kids to Disneyland, I live 15 minutes from it. So. <laughs> well, that, that depends. We have a we have a Disneyland in Paris as well. Yes, you do. You not, do. That's true. Not that that's far. True. So that's... Uh, yes, so there's, yes, that's um, uh, but but yeah, there's I have some friends who are really big fan of Disneyland and try to visit all Disneyland uh, around the world. So that's uh, it's not something I've tried so far, but that might <laughs> also be an option. That might also be an yes. option. Okay, I'm going to leave you. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, we'll uh, we'll keep in touch. I'll let you know when we uh, when this will be published. And uh, well, thank you for, for your time. Great. And you take care. Rest. Have a wonderful day. You too. Okay, this next little quick piece is uh, by Gillian Welsh, and it was from a movie, I think. Um, it's called I'll Fly Away, and I like it because it's a, a very cheerful song about our short time here on the planet. <laughs> Some bright morning when this light is over, I'll fly away to a place on God's celestial shores. I'll fly away, oh, I'll fly away, oh, glory, I'll fly away.
fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. When the shadows of this life has gone, I'll fly away. Like a bird from these prison walls, I'll fly. I'll fly away. Oh, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away to a place on God's celestial shores. I'll fly away, oh how glad and happy we will meet, I'll fly away, no more cold iron shackles on my feet, I'll fly away. Glory, I fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by, I fly away. All righty. Hope that works. <laughs> Thank you for watching Who's Agile, where the stories of Agilists come to life. I hope you liked today's interview. Subscribe if you're not subscribed and want to get to know other Agilists.